Welcome, everybody, back to the Rooted Netified show. I'm your host, Pat Elias, along with your co-host, Manny Elias. Hello. You're joining us for a special episode today with special guests, and the title is Power Couples Are Powered by God. We have Kevin and Janelle Batts today, and we're so excited to have you. We've got a happy dance for you. (laughs) Before we introduce our special guests even more, I have a few podcast reminders for you. This podcast is sponsored by and part of Beautifully Rooted, which is a Christian mental health and education corporation. The Root and Edified show is a fun-loving, no-facade, Bible-believing, conservative Christian worldview show for both men and women, where we go over testimonies, topics, talents within the church, and also theology, of course. And hopefully get a few laughs on the side if we can. We want to help encourage you in growing deeper in your relationship with Christ and also more mature in your walk. As a reminder, we put out both a video podcast and an audio one. So whichever is your preference, there is something available to you. If you have listened to today's show and you really want to help support us in some way, we would love to hear from you. And you can check out more information and find our contact information on our website, which is www.beautifullyrooted.com, which is spelled B-E-Y-O-U. We are excited to introduce to you Kevin and Janelle Batts, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them. Kevin and Janelle Batts are a husband and wife team of writers and creators that specialize in the media and government. They're founders of Red River Chronicle and Red River TV, which produces truthful media in Oklahoma and the nation as a whole. They reside in Oklahoma with their three children. Kevin and Janelle, would you mind telling us a little bit more about yourselves and about all the things that you do? We're happy to hear about it. Well, thanks for having us on, Manny and Kat. We're just thankful for podcasts like this, thankful for people that are making their voices heard and allowing people like my husband and I to to come on the show. So thanks for having us. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, we're originally from Oklahoma. <laughs> we were Texans for about 12 years yeah. and my husband was in the military. Yep. Started writing about veterans issues and eventually we moved over to writing about politics. That was in the awesome days of blogging. When yeah. You actually could have a blog and <laughs> if you did a good job, you ranked higher and your, you yeah. know, more people read your blog. And if yeah. you didn't do a good job, then people would refute you. And, you know, the Internet just kept itself policed in that way. Eventually, the algorithm started preferring videos. So we started doing videos. And once we started doing that, things kind of took off from there. Pretty much it. Yeah. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about Red River TV? Yeah. It kind of started the way that he said with the veteran issues. But what's interesting is that we didn't actually start off as this super political couple. You know, we were not activists. We were not political at all. I'll let him share maybe briefly what it looked like for him. But for me personally, I was not that interested. I didn't want to do any of this kind of stuff. I was like, no, you know, but I've shared this story before with my platform. What it looked like for me personally was we were living in Texas. I had just had our son and there's only a year apart between all of our children. So we were like in the throes of parenthood, you know, toddler on this end and, you know, baby on this end. And we didn't live anywhere near our family. It was just a really like chaotic time. And I remember it was during Obama's presidency and things really began to be uncovered, so to speak, as to what was really going on in our nation and really what the government was capable of. And I remember watching the news and I would have this thought that would come up every time I'd watch the news. And it was like, somebody needs to do something, you know, about this. This is insane. And one day I'm sitting there, kids screaming, crying, it's a mess. And I'm thinking that same thought watching the news. And I just heard God say, why don't you do something about it? And I remember thinking, well, no, somebody else can go do it. You know I mean? You're not expecting that, you know, to hear something like that. It looked like it wasn't for me. Now, I'm just this mom that's just like sitting at home. Now, mind you, my personality being a very black and white person, and I would have to say boldness. Now, I've always had that, but I never knew that this is what it would end up being us doing this together. So that's what it looked like for me. I don't know what it looked Um, like for you. I would say the more you go down the rabbit hole of these issues, the more you get to the nub of what we're dealing with, the more I went into it, the more I realized all the lies 
I've been told my entire life. And it's just like the enemy, you know, just to sow all these huge lies all over the place. Yeah. And more and more as we went through it, we just began to realize that, you know, this is a spiritual battle that we're dealing with. We're dealing with demonic forces here. We're dealing with demons. We're dealing with true evil. And that's where a lot of this stuff stems from. And so as you go down the rabbit hole, you start to see it. And then it becomes a crusade almost. If God's equipped you, you need to be out there doing that. And I think that God rose up, not just a bunch of big voice, like the old elites, they want to have these big voices, these big things. It's one big person to control the masses Mm -hmm. when God, he's going to raise up an army. Yeah. And the army isn't going to be a bunch of big people. It's going to be a bunch of medium sized, smaller, and everyone's going to be able to lend their voice to it. And I think that we've definitely on our side, the side of good, we definitely capitalized (laughs) on that idea. We all have voices. Everyone's job is to stand up. I think that interaction or that moment that Janelle had with God where he told her, you need to stand up. I think that at the same time, a lot of millions of other people were being told the same thing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people heeded that call. That's why you got things like Donald Trump. That's why you had things like a lot of the other movements that have come up. Lexit. Or not, and Lexit. Mm-hmm. All these different movements, all these different voices rising up. And I think that the enemy is going out of control right now. He's filling around because he's been exposed so many times. That's kind of where our main push comes from, exposing that. I think that's how couples like you guys and couples like us get to do this. You know, I think about that. We've come to this point where we're in two totally different parts of the state, but yet we're both releasing our voice and having conversations like this. So that's really awesome. Yeah. We definitely have heard the Holy Spirit speak to us as well. And I usually say you never regret listening to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's a little scary to venture out there, but you never regret it. Absolutely. So if people wanted to find out more about what you're doing, how could they get plugged into you and what you're doing and find out more? Well, you can definitely go on to Facebook and look up Red River TV, or they can go on to their, you know, the internet and type in Red River TV. One thing I wanted to ask is obviously... The name sounds catchy, Red River TV. Where did that come from? Five seconds that came over Red River TV. I was like, okay, we're doing stuff in Texas, but we were from Oklahoma, ties those two together. And, and I was it's like, the Red oh, River. The Red River. The Red River is what, mm-hmm. yeah, the Red River is the, the it borders, it borders yeah. Oklahoma and Texas, the Red River. Wow, does. Yeah. So I just figured it would be something to where, it works in Texas and it works in Oklahoma. So it actually worked out really good. What was funny about that was that when we were doing Red River Chronicle, we were just doing the journalism part. I started writing Red River TV on things before we were even doing anything. Time, it was like, what are we writing this down for? We're not doing that, you know, kind of a thing. And then literally, what was it? Maybe eight months later or something like that, we started doing the videos and it was named Red River TV. So I think God knew what he was probably doing in that. So. Wow. Wow. (laughs) So we love to hear testimonies about how powerful God is and what work he can do. He is so good and merciful. And especially as we are in the month of love, what would be more lovely than to hear about the wonderful work that he has done in bringing you together and through your marriage. Would you please tell us more about your testimony of how God worked in both of you and through you? Well, surprisingly, our anniversary is actually this month. We're going to be celebrating 15 years of marriage. And when we look back at that, we're like, oh, 15 years. Oh my gosh. You know what I mean? Because we think about everything that we, you know, we came through. I think what was really unique about us is that we really experienced a really unique set of circumstances in like the first, probably what, three to four years of our marriage. I mean, I'm not even going to lie. The first three to four years of our marriage was a very hellish it was very, very difficult. I knew that I was supposed to marry him. But boy, after we got married, I was like, this cannot be God. (laughs) It was one of those situations where it was like, this is crazy what we're dealing with. No way this is God. I've made a horrible mistake, blah, 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 blah. I should have known then that, you know, we have a very real enemy who can be quite effective when you are not in tune with God's heart over your life. If you're wounded and you're broken and you have all these issues we were really kind of like two broken people that were trying to fix each other. And it was like a disaster, you know, in the very beginning. We dated, but what was interesting was that God actually told me to break up with him. And he always likes to tell everyone that his heart was shattered. 
but God knew what he was doing in it. I was going through a very, very terrible time in my life at the time that we were dating. We were young and that's when I was going through alcohol abuse, substance abuse, whole nine yards. I mean, I, I really was like my whole life was a complete mess. He was actually one of the bright spots in my life because he had no influence on any of the things that I was doing. My parents thought that he was influencing me to do all these terrible things. And it actually was quite the opposite. I was heavy depression, suicidal, whole nine yards. But when God told me to break up with him, it was really, really difficult because I knew I was going to have to let it go. I was going to have to let the relationship go. And I did not want to, but I did. And uh, you deployed shortly after that, I think. Yeah, it it yeah. wasn't like it was like against my will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I volunteered to go overseas <laughs> to get to, to, to get away from to her. get away from I me. Want to be around? Yeah. I was mad because yeah. it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be with this person, and I can't be with him <laughs> yeah. because God told her to leave me. Yeah, it make any sense? Yeah, that's crazy to me. Do you feel that God had told you? To be with her? Oh, yeah. So that's, so this was, he was looking really crazy so when I, I told like, him this that. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And so I was like, you know what? Cool. I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to another country so I can get away from her. That's what I ended up doing. And you I sure went over did. there. And it pretty much changed my life. Who knows where I was God going knew. Yeah, God knew. God knew. He knew how the whole yeah. story was going to work mm-hmm. out because he was shattered. I was shattered. We were both confused. Well, why would God say that? Because it was so painful, you know, for both of us. And I I mean, I did. I, I probably cried for about a good three months. You know, he was gone and all this. Fast forward about a year or so later, he had come back. And right before he came back from his deployment, I had basically spent the year. Um, I moved back in with my parents basically to get myself together because I was, I was in pretty rough shape. I stopped getting high. I stopped drinking basically everything cold turkey and was still having to manage, you know, everything. But about probably a month before he came back, we didn't talk to each other like the whole time that he was gone, which was really difficult as well. That's like a year of our lives that there was like separation, no talking, nothing. And about a month before he returned home, I had a God gave me a dream. And what was crazy is that I knew in the dream that God was telling me that he was going to be my covering and that he was going to be my husband. And that was even more confusing because I was like, you just told me, you just told me to break up with the guy. But I knew what God was saying to me and he confirmed it to me through several different things that happened. One of the things, though, that God said to me, because I asked God, I said, God, why did you have me give him up if you're now giving me a dream and you're telling me that this is the person that I'm supposed to marry? What God said to me was has always been so special to me because he said, I really wanted to test your heart. He wanted to test my heart and to see if I was going to be willing to give that up. And when he when I did, he was able to turn around and give it right back to me, essentially, is what he was able to do. A year later, right? Yeah, right. A year later, I would have never thought that that was going to happen. I mean, I, we were both just shocked. And so when he came back, we started to date again. And then we got engaged because I was getting ready to move to a different city. And he was not going to let that happen. <laughs> so, no. so he was like, we're going to get engaged. And we did. Mm-hmm. And then we got married. It was interesting because we knew each other uh, in high school. We didn't really know each other in high school. We saw each other, you know, in high school. And yet God knew what he was doing with that. But the first few years of our marriage were very difficult. He deployed one year, exactly to the date, one year after we got married. So we spent our anniversary sitting on a cold floor in a basically a gymnasium at four o'clock in the morning waiting for them to load a bus. and be gone for about 15 months. That was very, very rough. I mean, he he can attest to that. It was really bad. We were separated. While he was gone, my grandfather died. Two months later, my brother was killed. It was just an awful time. And there was a lot of things that, you know, we probably didn't do right. When he deployed, we really were not expecting to come back and be together. We were done. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> we were done after that first year. I mean, it was like in the deployment. Oh, my gosh. And that it, was even worse. It was even worse. Five I, years of just hell. I had relapsed. I had gone back to getting high. I had gone back to getting drunk. After my brother was killed, he was killed in an automo- automobile accident um, on July 4th, literally hours before we were supposed to see him later on that day. Very difficult to my parents. My parents actually ended up divorcing not long after that. 
2008 was like literally the year from hell. Like it was, it was awful. When he came back, we had to come back and make a decision. We knew we were going to come back together. We were going to put all of it on the table. We were going to make the decision. If we walk away from this table, then it's over. But if we're both still sitting at this table, when you get back, then we know we're going to keep going. And we're going to fight for our marriage. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Literally. I mean, he came home and then a whole other fight began. He came back and essentially almost lost his mind. Really. Mm. When he came back, he had some, you can tell him about, you know, severe PTSD. Yeah. It was to the point to where he couldn't sleep without having to take pills. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would find him standing in rooms and he would have no recollection of where he was or what he was doing. He ended up, you can tell him about what happened. You ended up having an accident. Oh, and yeah, yeah. yeah I, had a, I had an accident driving to work. I don't remember it at all. He has no memory of um, driving any of it. I showed up to work and the police came and said that I had a hit and run. I didn't remember it at all. Only way they were able to convince me is that I had these dents in my truck. I had a big old truck. The whole I side of his truck was, was like, and stuff. yeah. And I got arrested. And they were supposed to do a lot of different things that would have ruined my life. I fortunately had favor with my boss and I ended up not, none of that ended up happening. Yeah. They knew something was wrong. Yeah. His superiors, superior officers, they all knew what kind of person that he was. They all knew his character. They all knew he was someone that they could trust. And they knew something is not right with Kevin because he doesn't do things so, like this. I had to spend the rest of my last year in the military, last year and a half, mm -hmm getting healed of all those things yeah. and i think we both spent the last we did that last year and a half both of us healing individually and also together and then after that when i we got out of the when we were done with the military it's almost like we were shot out of a cannon it yeah. seems like it's just been up and up and up from there just a good god lord's blessings and things yeah. like that yeah you know they told us we'd never have kids when that happened i think it was like there are things that you can do that Satan needs you to do to fall in line with him. And then there's things that you can do mm -hmm. that God needs you to do. That's going to open up his blessing into your life. Yeah. And because we were faithful during those times, we weren't perfect, yeah. but we were faithful. And when it came time to make those certain moves towards the right side, then God was able to bless us. You know, when the mm -hmm. enemy was able to finally be defeated and trying to tear us apart, yeah. finally be defeated in trying to hurt us both mentally with yeah. our own issues, yeah. bring us through the healing. And so when we got out of the military, it was almost like God covered us in that. And was like, the enemy's not going to have a chance to come yeah. in and deal with your marriage again, because that's over. The yeah. enemy's had his chance. And now you're out of this wilderness with that. Yeah. There was a real attack against yeah. our marriage from the very and beginning. So <laughs> then I feel like we were able to walk into our destiny, yeah. which is what we're doing right now with Red River TV. And God knew, but Satan knew. Yeah, exactly. And he knew what was ahead. We obviously know that Satan hates covenant. Yeah. He just despises covenant. There was a very clear attack against our marriage. Now, had we known that it was because of what God had brought together, we didn't know that. We were very young. We were very stupid. We did a lot of stupid things. And, and yet God knew through all of that where we were going. If you would have, you know, if someone would have told us that we would be doing any of this at this time, we would have immediately laughed at them and said, no, we're not doing anything. You know, what are you talking about? It's just interesting looking back now because we understand why God did what he did. And we also understand the incredible need to protect this covenant and to protect our relationship and to protect our marriage. One of the reasons I just wanted to say that's really important about this, I think that now marriage is under attack even more so than ever before. I mean, you can just tell. We can't speak to maybe numbers statistically, maybe just in the nation or even in the world. But I know that in the military, the statistics for divorce is like 50% divorce rate. It's very, very high. Going through deployments is very difficult. And we are immensely thankful that we did not have to bring our children into that. Our daughter was actually born about two months after his exit date, which was amazing because he always said, I just, I can't bring kids into this. It almost tore us apart. And we just knew, he, he just knew he couldn't do it anymore. What was interesting about that too, is that we went into even the whole idea of having children as feeling so broken. 
I'm sitting here thinking, I, I can't have, you know, the doctors are saying that I can't have kids, They're having all these problems. I'm looking across the room. I have my husband sitting over here who literally almost lost his mind. Our marriage is struggling because of that. And all I could think of was how, how are we going to bring a kid into this? Like, how is any of this, is gonna, how's it going to happen? Because it just seemed so unattainable. And I think that's why we just so believe in the miraculous. And we just so believe, we so believe in a miraculous God because he did things that we were told no so many times. And God just came in and said, well, it doesn't really matter what society is telling you. And it doesn't really matter what your thoughts are telling you or what your family members are telling you, or even what the circumstance is telling you. When God steps into a situation, literally anything is possible, literally. And I know that sometimes Christians like to be very flippant and cliche about that statement, but we learned individually and as a couple We couldn't have done any of this without God. I mean, he came through and stepped into so much darkness in our lives over and over and over again to the point to where we look at those kids. It's like, that's a miracle. We're about to celebrate 15 years of marriage. That is a miracle. We're doing what we're doing right now. It's a miracle. My husband is not walking around dealing with trauma and still having blackouts. And that's a miracle. And this is without having to take the 50 different drugs. All of these things, we didn't go the direction that the world went. We found out that there really was a way, you know what I mean, that God has for his people to come to the other side and to not smell of smoke and to be right in the palm of his hand, you know, in the midst of it all. Now, are we still in some battles right now? Oh, yeah. There are probably going to be battles ahead. Yeah. But I think that's one of the reasons why I say that we have an Americanized way of thinking about marriage sometimes instead of a kingdom mindset about marriage. God didn't put this man and myself together because, oh, either we have to fix each other or you're here to please me in in every single way possible in my life. And that's it. Or we see it as a way of God put this together so that we could make God's dreams come true upon the earth. He puts marriages together to create something amazing and to be a powerful force within the earth. He puts marriages together to advance the kingdom of God. And I think a lot of people don't see marriage that way in America, especially our generation. It's just about the drama and making each other happy, having these unrealistic goals about marriage and not realizing that it really has little to do with us and it has everything to do with God. I firmly believe that Like I said before, I do believe that Satan is after marriages. And I do believe that it is because of what God is putting together for such a time as this. And I'm going to reiterate, when couples like us are having conversations with couples like you guys, the devil hates that because we're promoting covenant, we're promoting togetherness, we're promoting unity, which is something that the enemy absolutely despises. We always say that the that the family unit is the original war unit. And when you don't have that unity, you're going to have what we have today, which is a broken down society, which is just completely broken. But I believe that God is putting marriages together and has put marriages together for such a time as this. And we've talked to other couples that have said, man, I don't really know how my husband and I made it, or I don't really know how my wife and I made it this far because we've come through so much, but they're actually realizing that in this hour, they're being launched straight into who God's created them to be as a couple. A lot of people ask us, how do you guys work together? Because they're just like, oh, I couldn't do that, you know, because it is your spouse and and you have to work through that. And it was not easy. In the beginning, it was difficult. But one of the things that we always try to encourage people in is that, number one, we had to learn to respect each other. And number two, we had to learn to be able to see how the Spirit of God was moving in each other. And how to let that person's gift and ability that the Lord has given them be able to flow. And so you have to be humble in those moments and you have to be attentive in those moments. And we we didn't we didn't do it all right in the beginning. We we butt heads and we did all the normal things that, you know, that people do. But we really started to see the purpose of why him and I were together when we started to allow our giftings to come together. 
And we stop seeing our weaknesses in each other as weaknesses. I tell people all the time, people think that because I'm just the person that's on the camera, that that means that my husband doesn't have anything to say. But in reality, I'm always trying to get people to go talk to him. Like, please go talk to him because he's one of the most intelligent people that I know. And his understanding of government and how it's linked historically and all of that. I mean, it's far superior, far superior to mine. But what we learned is that he was an excellent writer when we started and we learned how to take the depth of what he had, but I knew how to convey it in a practical way to the people that we were talking to every single day on video. And so we started to learn that we didn't get upset at each other anymore about our weaknesses. We started figuring out that, wait a minute, where I'm weak in this area, he's actually quite strong. And we can let those things come together and really produce something quite powerful and produce a really powerful message that people can actually understand and lay hold of. It's taken some time, but I think that's been one of the biggest things that I've learned from this. I don't know about him, but I've had a whole new respect for him through this journey, Mm -hmm. just a whole new respect for him. Because again, his journey looks totally different than mine, even before we got married. But I know that I'm a miracle, but it's looking at God in him and knowing that this is a miracle as well. If society took his past and took his childhood and all of those things and put it under a microscope, they would say, oh, you're not supposed to be doing any of this. You're supposed to be here. You're supposed to be here. You're supposed to be dead. You're supposed to be on the streets. You're supposed to be in a gang. You're supposed to have five children out of wedlock. I don't know. You're supposed to be all of these different things except what he is. And so I think that that's been one of the cool parts is when you begin to, again, you see the miraculous all around you. You see the miraculous inside of each other that that God did. I do have a question for you guys regarding your marriage and your walk with Christ. When was it that you both came to Christ? Did you guys come to Christ together or were you guys already each individually Christian before you met? I would say she grew up in the church and she knew what God had for her in her life. And she knew that she was something special and that she had a special purpose and all these other things. But, you know, that just goes to show you that even though you could know, you still could go the wrong way. Yeah. You know, and even yeah. and even more under the weight of that. Knowing that the enemy is coming after you, sometimes on the truth will lead you down that wrong road even worse. She knew that I always believed in God and I always feel like I had a relationship with God. And I always felt like God's grace was over my life, even though I grew up the way I grew up and being told the lies I was being told about what my real destiny was going to be. The enemy tried to tell me what my destiny was going to be at an early age, and I never believed him instinctively. Until I got to actually got to know God and be around godly things and all these different things like that, I had to kind of go with my gut and my gut was always going with God when I look back. It always went with the Lord. I always felt like God was walking with me even in that time when I didn't know him. I would say I came to know God later on and seeing it in her and how it played out in her life, that kind of brought it closer to me, let me know that there was no other thing that could heal me when I was dealing with the issues with PTSD and all that. I knew the lies of putting band-aids on things with drugs. When I hit that dead end, there was only one way to go for me and it was with God. So that was it. Thank God for that. Amen. And, you know, it was interesting because we did have two different backgrounds. I tell people all the time, and I've shared it on my platform before, but it's like the devil doesn't care about you growing up in church. He knows what is inside of you. You are God's creation. He despises you for that alone. It doesn't matter. He's going to come after you in any way that he can. He's going to use all of your generational issues and all of your stuff to really try to destroy your life. I like to tell people that I got saved when I was seven, but I found God when I was 21 because that was when it was true for me. It was not an understanding of who my parents, God was, or my pastor or anyone. It was the raw reality of Jesus Christ in the midst of total darkness in my life. And then really from that point on, I mean, I would say we really kind of had a chance to grow together in God after that. I mean, you would think that I'd be the one that'd be leading him. I was the one I can fool the whole time. He was the one that would just be, man, he'd be calling me out on my stuff. And I'd be so mad. Like, I'm the one that grew up in the church. You're not supposed to know that. But God used him so many times in my life because I didn't know relationship. He didn't grow up in the church. So he just knew God. I I knew the stuff. You know what I mean? I knew the right things. But those things didn't 
help me because it was more about the rules and it was not about the relationship with God. If there was a scripture that for me could embody a lot of what you're talking about, or at least the scripture that comes to mind would be second Corinthians four, eight through nine, which is we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Yes. One of my favorites. <laughs> Isn't it? It's just a story of resilience and how the Lord has pulled you through. And your story really points to the almighty work of Jesus. I think it's such a message of hope for all those that are out there at whatever stage they are in their marriage, what a reminder, or even being single. I think it's a message of hope of how the Lord can work in your life in the miraculous ways and give you a totally different path than you thought was going to happen, but it was ordained by the Lord. So that scripture really does call out to me. I, I call that the down, but not out scripture. Cause I can never remember where that scripture is at, but it just really reminds me that you can be down, but not out. The Lord will bring that resilience. Speaking of all the spiritual attacks that come along with a godly centered marriage, how do you two maintain a godly Christ centered marriage despite those spiritual attacks? There's the covenant that you have with God. So there's this, there's a relationship and there's the communion that we individually have with God. But what we've learned is that when we are both in tune with what God is saying, it causes us to be more in tune with each other spiritually and able to know if one of us is dealing with something. When we have the communion open individually with God, it caused us to know how to release what needed to be released in those moments of crisis. And so it could be just a single word. I mean, for me, when I was going through my stuff, he would say things to me that was just like, I needed to hear those things. He didn't mince his words, but he spoke total truth to me. And I knew that it was the word of the Lord for my life in that moment. And he wasn't afraid to say that to me because, well, that's my, that's just my wife. We learned how to stop and know how to hear the voice of God in each other, or else we could miss truth. We could miss something that God was doing. So that's what it looked like for me. It really came through a place where he would speak something to me. And I would know that the Lord was speaking through my husband, a word to me that you've got to come up out of this and you've got to keep moving forward. And I think for me, what it looked like for him was I interceded a lot for him. It was more of a silent thing for me. I would be interceding for my husband. He wouldn't know that I was interceding for him. I would watch God intervene in his life over and over and over again as I was in that intercession for him. Your relationship with God individually is very, very important because it helps the covenant that you have as one with God become even stronger. Because if this is weak individually, this is going to be weak as well. As far as your connection with God's voice, your connection with truth, because God embodies truth completely. And so that's what it looked like for me. I don't know what it looked like for you as far as being able to come through different crises, but uh, just it, trusting. Sometimes the enemy would lie mm -hmm. and try to say, because I dealt with a lot of manipulative women growing up yeah, a lot. So it took a long time for me to be able to not filter it through that. He was know. distrustful of me for yeah. a while in our marriage because of that wound I, yeah, towards I saw manipulative of, I women. I saw women sabotage yeah. men and the men that will try to come into our lives. Yeah. The women would s manipulate them and sabotage them or have them sabotage themselves. Yeah. You know, the God had to deal with me about that. The enemy tries to, you know, he's going to use those things to put blocks in between you two mm -hmm. and you got to deal with them. And I think we get triggered by things that are not resolved before. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what I would say was dealing with your stuff. And mm -hmm. it's not fun yeah. and you have to deal with it. So <laughs> dealing necessary. with your stuff is necessary yeah. to unlocking. So it's almost like in order to deal with that thing, you have to deal with something else. And so once you unlock that and it ain't like, it's like instant, you know, it's going to take some time. You, it's like yeah. muscle memory. You build it up over time. And mm -hmm. now it's to the point to where it's like, I've listened to her so many times. I don't filter it through that anymore. Yeah. I know when it's coming. Well, he got to a place to where he could trust that what he was hearing was God's heart and God's love for him. But I also had to be in a position where I had to be very careful 
the enemy wants to repeat patterns in the next generation. And he wanted to take all of my issues generationally and make sure that it destroyed him some kind of way and all of his issues. You know, he's going to try to put those things together to make just one big explosion instead of something that God wants to produce that's full of life and full of love and full of peace in your life. But I had to let God deal with me where there were any places in me that were manipulative towards him because that would be repeating history. That would be me being put in his life to destroy him and not empower him and, you know, love him and all those things. But I had to be very careful that what I was saying to him was God's heart and that it was the spirit of God speaking and not me reacting to him out of fear and trying to manipulate his choices because I was afraid for him and I was trying to control what he was doing because I just wanted him to be okay. God used a lot of the crisis, actually. He used a lot of the a lot of the issues to really teach us that we did not go through it very well. In a lot of instances, it was pretty messy in some instances. But that's what I love about God is the sufficiency of his grace. It never runs out. And he knows when we're trying to get there. He knows when we're stumbling our way through. And so we learned a lot from the test. Yeah, we really did. We learned a lot about each other and learned a lot about total dependency upon God or else I'm telling you, marriage is a hot mess. Mm -hmm. You can really destroy each other. The enemy has an inheritance for us, just like the way God has an inheritance for us. His inheritance is total destruction. Just the complete annihilation of who you are is the annihilation of the next generation. It's the annihilation of your entire bloodline that was meant to worship God. That was meant to be this amazing force upon the earth. We watched the destruction of the enemy quite a bit in the beginning of our marriage. But then suddenly when things begin to shift, that's when we begin to see the inheritance of God begin to take over our lives. It's like night and day where we started and where we are now. That was amazingly insightful. Two scriptures that come to my mind while you're sharing that is Jesus' description of the, of the devil, of the enemy. He goes, for the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that you would have life in life in abundance. And then the same author of that gospel, John, writes in 1 John and says, for this reason has the Son of God appeared, to destroy the works of the devil. And it's just so beautiful. It just emanates through what you're sharing, the power of the Lord Jesus, the power of God and the Holy Spirit to do this work in your marriage. So beautiful. I rejoice with your testimony. I really do. It's amazing. Thank you. It's refreshing talking about it, to be honest. I think that's one of the points of marriage. Like you mentioned, it's not so much about that we feel good and that we have companionship, but God utilizes marriage to sharpen each other. Mm, good point. There's Absolutely. no other person that is going to sharpen us better than our spouse that we live with all the Absolutely. time that sees every aspect of us. We can't hide anything. The Lord is definitely the hammer, but our spouse is the chisel for sure. He sure is. I tell people all the time, I'm like, um, people are like, I just want to get married. I'm like, so you do realize that marriage is like one big, long deliverance session. Like, it's just, you talk about making you holy and then you want to have children. Like, oh, you must want to be really holy then. <laughs> I think what you're mentioning in regards to making sure that we have our relationship well with Christ as much as we possibly can, being focused on that, being plugged in consistently, and how much that helps with our relationship with our spouse. And I think that's a great reminder, even for those people who are single, who might be thinking, well, that's about married people, and I'm not there yet, so I don't have to worry about that piece. But you really want to be in good practice of that mm. relationship with Christ and that consistency so that you can employ that in your marriage when it's challenged extra. So don't tune out single people. Make sure you're listening. So the next question I have for you is for those couples who might be thinking that they would like to work together for the kingdom of God, but they're really unsure of where God is calling them or how to get started. Do you have any advice or encouragement for them to get started and walking in the right direction? I think the biggest thing I would say is God is going to show you exactly where your area of influence is. Let God lead in all of it. Because what will happen is you can get very, very discouraged and you can get very, very frustrated because you start trying to create what you think that God's wanting to do, but know that God is, he is big enough and he is capable enough to literally get you from point A to point B and begin to set things up in your life that literally is who you were meant to be upon the earth. I think the biggest thing is being patient. 
God is very, very strategic and he pays attention to details. And so the details are more actually more important to him than where you're going to end up. But know that that passion that he's put in you, if you just can't sleep at night and it's just in you, just know that God gave you that. And the enemy is going to try to convince you that it's not God, but God gave you that passion and let God lead. He'll breathe on it. Praise God. Thank you. So now we're thinking about single folk or those that find themselves widowed, but they still want to work for the kingdom of God. Do you think that they can have an impact too? And what would be your advice for them? Yeah, absolutely. We've actually had a lot of people that have said that to us. And I think that the enemy really tries to really use the lie, particularly with people that are single, that God can't use them because what, they, what am I going to do? You know, kind of a thing. But some of the people that are leading some of the biggest things, even in states like Oklahoma, these are like single people. These are people that are widowed. These are people, I mean, they are making huge differences in the grassroots movements. They're making huge differences. And again, it goes back to the passion that God gave them. They were like, we couldn't shut it down. We didn't know why we were so passionate about this. But all of a sudden, we woke up and this started happening and these people started calling and they had put things together overnight. So my encouragement for that would be absolutely do not think that you have to be married to start what God's already begun and know that if God wants to bring a person into your life and join them to you, that it is going to be for the purpose of you fulfilling your destiny and you helping that person fulfill their destiny. It will be for the, for the kingdom of God to come together. I was thinking about in the Bible, the Lord used married people, single people, children. He used people of all different places, but for his own purpose. So maybe he utilizes couples in a specific way that is the most impactful because you have a man and woman together for the kingdom of God doing that work. Yes. But then he also works in a mighty way with those that are single that probably the best benefit that comes out of it is from somebody who's a single. And, and, just, and I believe that in certain certain ministries, like the Apostle Paul says, you know, when he's preaching the gospel, obviously, you know, it's much easier at that point if you're committed to Christ and you're preaching the gospel and you know you're entering very dangerous territory, right? Especially if you're doing missionary work. Paul says, if you have the gift of continence like I do, then pray and you know what? Go and do it in the name of the Lord and you only worry about serving and pleasing the Lord. Right? Yeah. The only time he says yeah. to definitely seek a spouse is like, if you don't have the gift of continence, then at that point, it's much better to marry than to be burning. There may be things that a single person can do that maybe a married couple is not able to do. There may be places that a single person can go that maybe a, a married couple can't go. A widow may have a revelation of something and may be able to reach a group of people that maybe a married couple has maybe not have as a good as connection, you know, to. I mean, that's why I love like what you said, you know, how God, he uses it all for his purposes. The last thing I'll ask, you know, you're both so bold for your faith and for truth. What would you say to those that are more shy, introverted, maybe even a little insecure about putting themselves out there to help motivate them to take that first step? Um, I would say probably, I mean, you don't have to be out in front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might not be your gift. You know, your gift might be, you may be a writer, you may be someone that volunteers somewhere and does something. It may not have anything to do with politics. It might be something completely different. A lot of the things that involve media is work that doesn't pay anything. Mm -hmm. So if you have time, that's gold mm -hmm. to people because, you know, we need people all the time for mm -hmm. different things, if it, whether it be writing scripts or whether it be um, proofreading things or mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things that people can do to get activated right in their own community. I think now, too, because there's kind of this idea politically that you have to have this certain personality, you've got to be super loud and, you know, you've got to be really, you know, just whatever. And I've actually had conversations with people that bless their hearts, they were counting themselves out mm -hmm. because they were, they were more shy and they were like, I don't really speak well in front of people, but they just immediately thought that they weren't supposed to be involved in change because of their temperament and because of their, you know, the characteristics and, and their personality. Yeah. And we told them it was like, no, you are meant to make a mighty, mighty sound upon the earth. It may not look the way that ours looks. It may not look the way that that person over there, you know, may look, but you are still meant to advance against the kingdom of darkness. And it may be through a pen and it may be through a blog and it may be through, I I don't know, uh, you know, feeding the homeless on the weekends. It may be any of those. We like to always say that this army that's arising, it's a faceless, nameless army. 
of people that are filled up with the Holy Spirit and that are willing to give their lives to advance the kingdom of God. And that's going to come with all kinds of different people of all kinds of different colors and ages. And I want to say that to the older generation as well. The boomer generation, the generation further back than that, those people are not counted out. We need those voices. We need all of the generations to come together. They know a lot of the truths that we've forgotten. Good point. Let's jump into the scripture section. Kevin and Janelle, do you have particular scriptures that might be helpful for somebody to remember based off of kind of what we're talking about today that you brought today? I do, actually. It may Mm -hmm. seem a little bit of a cliche scripture, a cliche marriage scripture, but I want to I'll elaborate quickly on what it made me think of. And it's Genesis 218. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Uh, I will make him a helper fit for him. What made me think about this scripture was the word fit always stands out to me. And I know there's different versions that say different things, but how the Lord joins and fits marriages together. He fits these things together for his purposes and how exciting that that is. You don't have to see marriage as some kind of weird burden. God didn't create it that way. But you also don't have to see marriage for selfish reasons. Um, You don't have to see marriage as this path of perfection that, you know, where you're just trying to please. It's really something unique that God literally joined and fitted together himself. It's important to be knitted together the way that God wants you to. And I think that I say that to the single people <laughs> um, because, you know, we, we have a lot of people that they're just searching for, you know, well, what does this person's paycheck look like? Mm-hmm. And what does this look like? Like, you know, all of the all of the carnal things, instead of thinking about marriage eternally and thinking about it as what is God trying to join me together with for his purposes in the future? That includes our children. When I read that and I thought about how I used to read it before we got married, I did not know the meaning of that scripture at all. But I have learned what that scripture means and what God put together. The enemy is going to try to come after it. But man, we serve a powerful God that when he puts something together, it's so intertwined that it'd be almost impossible with God that the enemy would be able to destroy it. And so I hope that people are excited. I I hope that our generation and all the generations would get excited about marriage, especially if you're a Christian, because God wants to join something together that is really awesome. He really wants to join something together. He's not putting you together so that you can bicker and be mad. He's putting something together that is for his purpose. He's putting something together because he knew that Kevin needed Janelle. He knew that Janelle needed Kevin. He knew that Kat and Manny were going to be together at some point, and they were going to be releasing a sound of faith and releasing a sound of hope that was going to be able to draw people in to hear that sound. I hope that's an encouragement to people Mm -hmm. uh, in marriage to maybe have a slightly different perspective on it going into it. So the scriptures that I brought today, I think are ones of hope. I hope that will remind you of the blessings that can come along with marriage and should give you encouragement waiting for that day that the Lord will provide that person, which is Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And then that really speaks to what you were just saying is that that threefold cord is not quickly broken. And just a reminder to those that are single, I hope it's an encouragement to you. If you don't have that married partner spouse yet, and you haven't been popped the question or haven't given that question to somebody else, there's an important reason why we have brothers and sisters in Christ, why we have community. You can be two or more as friends. That yes. person can still help you oh, up fellowship. when you when you fall. So this, I think, is super applicable to marriage, but you can also have that through your community, especially if God has called you to be single or you find yourself single right now for whatever reason. Two are better than one. You should not be a lone range Christian. You should not be an, a Christian. Ranger, huh? Absolutely. That person who's yeah. alone, we have community. It's out there and for a reason. And the second scripture, just as a reminder to those husbands and to wives as well, 
Proverbs 18.22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. A good thing. And obtains favor from the Lord. Just a reminder. Amen. Yes. You have favor from the Lord. Kevin, you have favor. <laughs> we got y'all getting y'all's reminders tonight. <laughs> you have guidance. I have guidance. You have guidance. It's very true. You have guidance. I'm very blessed. I, I love this scripture because even though it is obviously probably the main scripture is that a lot of preachers resort to when preaching on, on marriage. Yet I love this scripture so much because I think it really lays out the roles for husband and wife. And it, this is the passage, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And I love this part. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. I think, man, Paul really lays it out on how a marriage should be. And to me, the way he wraps it up with that quote from Adam that's a quote from Adam where Adam said, right? A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. But yet he then interjects the mystery of that and how important marriage is because of what he's about to interject, which is what it represents. It says, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. That love that yeah. we have for each other as husband and wife is representative of the greatest love known to mankind, the love of Christ for his church, you know, that union. It really is meant to exemplify that. Amen. It's like, Amen. help us to and, get back to that, Lord. <laughs> and, and that's why, once again, going back to what you said, um, Janelle, the family is the original war unit. That's where God operates. That's how God infuses humanity with his word, with his principles, is through family. And when that father loves Christ with all his heart, and that mother loves Christ with all her heart. And they love each other with that same love, right? That bond of love that is only found in Christ, nowhere else. And I love my culture. I love my heritage. But even in my heritage, that's not found. That's not what gave that to us. Christ gave that to us. Us being Gentiles who were not naturally children of Abraham. Through faith in Christ, all these covenants, all that promise that he made to Abraham is now made to us. We're now made co-heirs. And I love that because I tell Kat, you know, yes, you are my wife. And sometimes as a husband, especially the way you're brought up, I might sometimes treat you the way I learned in my heritage, how men treat wives. And that's sometimes very chauvinistic, to be honest with you. I'm like, I don't want to be part of the jerks for Jesus movement. You know, I don't want to be <laughs> part of the jerks for Jesus movement. I tell her, you know, sometimes I can be that. But one of the things that reminds me of this is, my identity is now no longer found just in my heritage. It's found in Christ. And I have to be a husband the way Christ loves the church. And I'm like, how? Sanctifying her, sharing the word with her, which cleanses her and bringing her closer to the Lord. And also remembering that she is my co-heir. She is my co-heir in Christ. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. Absolutely. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So as we conclude today, what would be one thing you would just want everybody that's listening to walk away remembering they, if they forget everything else, but they will remember this one thing, what would that takeaway be? I think that there is a kingdom way that God really is trying to uncover for this up and coming generation of people that have maybe yet to be married, but people who are married as well. There really is a kingdom marriage. There is such a thing as a kingdom marriage. And it has little to do, again, I know I've spoken about it a couple of times, but 
God is trying to get his people away from an Americanized way of living. He is trying to get his people to a kingdom way of living, and that includes marriage. It's not going to look like the Western way. It's not going to sound like the Western way. I think the biggest thing is, is that we want to strive to exemplify the power of God instead of just being the hashtag power couple. You know what I mean? We really want to exemplify true power. That power can only come forth through our covenant with each other, but our covenant with God. If that's the biggest message that I could send to people is your covenant with God and your covenant with your spouse is one of the most powerful tools against the enemy and to never, ever, ever not fight for it. Don't ever not fight for it. Always fight for it. Mm-hmm. Did you have anything? to? Uh, no, just mainly that, you know, well, everything she said is essentially just replace the West and all other stuff with demonic <laughs> and <laughs> demons and Satan. So the fight, the fight is against <laughs> demons and Satanism and Satan himself. Yeah, and really he is. Wants to, and he doesn't <laughs> want you to get married. Yeah. He doesn't want you to do things the right way. Yeah. And the number one thing, even if you're not political and you never want to be political, and you have no plans on doing that. The most political thing you can do right now is to be upright. Yeah. To pick a wife, marry her, build yeah. a home, build a family and raise godly children. That yeah. is the ultimate rebuke to the devil yeah. and, the, and the enemy yeah. of the kingdom. Yeah. Wholeness. Is, we, we, I'm, I'm going to make a T-shirt. I'm telling you, I'm going to make a T-shirt one of these days, but I'm going to say wholeness is the new rebellion to be whole and to produce whole children and to have a whole marriage is the ultimate act of rebellion in this hour. I'd buy the shirt. I'm sure we all would. Thank you so much, Kevin and Janelle, for coming on today and for sharing your wisdom with us and your story. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And thank you to all those who are watching this episode today or who are listening. We really appreciate that you're joining us. If you enjoyed what you heard, you were very encouraged by it, please give us a a like, a subscribe, follow so that you don't miss anything. And it will be encouraging for us to keep on going. And we would love to hear your positive comments as well. And I'm sure Kevin and Janelle would also love to hear that. So we're looking forward to that. And don't forget, we're on most of all of your podcast platforms. You'll be able to find us there. We are also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, and you're going to find some things on there that you don't find on our podcast platform. So make sure you check us out there and follow so that you don't miss anything. So as we conclude tonight, would you mind, Janelle, or Kevin, would you mind closing us out in prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. God, I just want to thank you for this time. I just want to thank you for Kat and Manny. I just want to thank you, God, for amazing couples like this that are willing to, I mean, take the time and the effort, God, and the resources that you've given them to really speak out about issues that are so important, not only to families and not only to the body of Christ, but are so important to our nation. God, we're so thankful for them. We're so thankful for this platform that you've given them. And so, Lord, we just thank you for being able to bring couples, God, like this together and to begin to release such a sound of faith and such a sound of hope, Lord, to the nation and to the nations of the earth. God, to say that you are the one true God and that there is no other God like you to be able to represent you, to be able to represent heaven. So God, we just pray for all of those that are listening tonight. We just pray, Father God, that any any viewers, any listeners, Lord, that have questions that are seeking your heart, God, for their lives, we just thank you that they're going to find something. They're going to hear something that's going to speak to them. That's going to, to hopefully just bring a shift in their life, God, to help them to pivot in the right direction and begin to hear your voice in a clearer way. So God, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together and do this. And we just decree by faith tonight, God, that you have a plan and purpose for the listeners. You have a plan and a purpose for our nation. You have a plan and a purpose, God, for California, for Oklahoma, and all the states in between. And we align ourselves, God, with your heartbeat tonight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Thank you so much. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you guys for having us on. (laughs) Thank you so much for having us on. Bye.